Welcome to the Existential Empath Podcast. My name is Tanya and I am an intuitive empath. My intention is to share valuable tips, tools, and techniques that I have learned so you can tap into your own inner healer naturally and intuitively. Welcome back, everyone, and Happy New Year. I hope you are all getting the new year off on the right foot. Today, I have guest Kim Hamer. Kim is a human resources consultant, public speaker, and author of 100 Acts of Love, a girlfriend's guide to loving your friend through cancer or loss. After her husband's death, Kim noticed that managers received little to no guidance when navigating cancer or death within their teams. She saw how their lack of helpful tools and guidance was costly, how it negatively affected employee engagement, increased turnover rates, and lowered productivity. Kim has set out to change that, combining her personal experience, professional knowledge and leadership skills, she launched 100 Acts of Love, a consultancy that provides tools to help leaders increase team productivity, trust and engagement when cancer affects the entire team. Welcome, Kim. It is a pleasure to have you on the show today and Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year to you too. And it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the for the invite. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So today you and I are going to talk about coping with crisis, navigating cancer and loss in the workplace. So, you know, most of my listeners know that I myself worked in the area of grief and loss through hospice, organ donation and transplantation for more than 15 years. So I saw firsthand the effects that cancer, trauma, and death can have on an organizational team and individual level. You know, so whether you are someone who is actually going through cancer or loss yourself, or maybe you are a manager with an employee or a coworker going through something difficult, it is our intention today to share our experiences that we've had with you to kind of help you navigate through these crises in your life. So Kim and I are going to talk about <laughs> how to deal with these difficult conversations around cancer and death. We're going to talk about the awkward moments, what to say, what not to say. And we're going to also talk about the overall support that either we need to give or receive when navigating cancer, grief, and death, especially in the workplace. So Kim, let's first start off with your story and what led you to the conversation that we're having today. Sure. So I like to start my story with a story. Um, and it is that we are in the doctor's office and the doctor is talking to my husband and me about the treatment. And he says to my husband, you're not going to be able to work for about six to eight months. Wow. And then he continues talking and my husband's nodding and, you know, listening. And I just stopped listening because we didn't have six to eight months of savings in our account. Mm -hmm. And for several nights, I lost a lot of sleep. I would, couldn't figure out how are we going to do this? Did this mean we have to move? We were across country from our family. I mean, we have to move back East, get a whole new doctor. Like he's really sick. This isn't like a simple, easy move. Um, and then I, so a couple nights of no sleep. And then I hear my husband a couple of days later, I hear my husband talking to his boss on the phone and his voice sounds really weird. And I'm just kind of get up off the couch. I walk into the study and um, as I'm walking in, my husband hangs up the phone and I said, sweetheart, you know, what did Tom say? And he doesn't just say anything. And I'm like, like what? Like I, the floor just fell out from underneath us. That's what I felt like. And finally he said, Tom just said that they will cover my salary for the time that I'm in treatment. Wow. And what that's a blessing. Ex what exactly. A blessing. And at that mm -hmm. point, you know, I was so stunned. I walk over to my husband and we both just start, I hug him and we both start to cry. And while I realized that mo many organizations can't do that, and there were some other things that we made up for part of that salary that we, that we did. Um, but that was really the first, the first thing that I noticed that companies, can, how companies can support employees. So my husband has cancer. He's stage four, very serious. He's fighting literally. I mean, I, I I don't use that term. You know, people, I'm fighting for my life, but he literally was fighting through for his life. And what Kim, what type of cancer did he have? It was large B cell lymphoma stage four. And it was just, you know, he we didn't catch it till it was all over his lungs. That was the number one cue is the clue is that he went out for a run and then couldn't run. And he's like, I don't know what's going on. Um, so he 
he and disentangles himself because I don't like the word battle and win. Yeah. Um, he disentangles <laughs> himself from the cancer and then it comes back. And four months after that, he dies and he's 44 and our kids are 12, nine and seven at the time. And something I noticed during, during both bouts of cancer and after he died is some people seem to know exactly what to do and what to say and how to be supportive. And other people didn't have a clue. And it was really painful to, to be with, to be around some of those people who would just say hurtful things. I knew that they didn't mean it, but it was still hurtful. And people who just disappeared. We had friends who, you know, we thought would show up with, you know, you know, lawyers, guns and money to help. And they just disappeared. And then we had other people who we didn't know very well step in. Um, and so that's, that's who your friends are, right? When you go through these crises. Yes. Yes. That's what I thought. And then when I came to the other side of it, which took several years, I realized that all those people who I was really angry at, who, you know, didn't show up, they simply didn't know what to do. Most of them. I'm going to give, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt. They didn't know what to do. And in their own fear and lack of, of, and it, lack of being able to find any resources, they just backed away. Uh -huh. And I knew that some of them carried that shame with them. And so that's how the book came about was because I wanted to write a book to show people how easy and important it is that you show up for someone dealing with a crisis. And the reason it was so important is because I, you know, I'm not here because I'm like, Oh, I beat this thing. You know, I, I put one foot in front of the other. I am here because I stand on the foundation of all the support and help that we got during this time. And I wanted people to really understand how vital it is and also how simple it is. They didn't need to plan to bring meals for the six months, mm -hmm. you know, every Monday for six months. It didn't need to be that overwhelming. So I go back to work. And my very first job is in HR is working for a man, a, a president of a company whose wife has cancer oh my and goodness. then she dies. Oh. And I watched the company, like I sort of thought that maybe the company would do what they'd done for my husband mm -hmm. and they fall apart and there's no support. And I've got dealing with managers who are now terrified of this president because he's at work, grieving at work, which is a perfectly fine place to go, yeah. right? He's grieving at work and he's losing his mind. He's yelling, he's short-tempered, you know, he's erratic. Yeah. He's like displacing um, his emotions. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So so, you know, they're trying to figure it out. And, and I remember, I remember when we first learned that the wife died, everyone was like, what should we bring? And one person was like, bring a platter of cold cuts. And I was like, no, don't bring food. Because I knew that his refrigerator was already full of everyone else bringing food. So, so I tried to help them as best I can, but that's where the, that's where the seed got planted is understanding that, you know, death happens at work. Yeah. Death happens to coworkers. Death happens, you know, on the way home from work. Death happens all the time. Cancer. And I've recently widened my scope to include depression because yeah. there are people who are owning their depression at work and saying, I'm dealing with depression. I need some accommodations. So how do you have these conversations, these difficult conversations when you're a manager, when you have to get things done? but you don't want to be seen as an asshole, right? Absolutely. You don't want to be seen as the manager's like, I'm really sorry you're dealing with cancer, but when are you going to get that report in, right? Mm -hmm. So so there is this really, there's a line that managers can walk and it's not that difficult, but it requires kind of working through five stages and repeating them over and over and over again. And when I came up with these five stages, of course I realized, oh, we can use these in our personal lives yeah, as well. Totally, they all so, intertwine, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And, and Kim, to take it back, you know, it's so simple, like to take it back to the beginning of your story, when you said that the doctor said you won't be able to work for six to eight months, it really is filling our, our basic needs because the moment you heard that, what did you do? You tuned out, you tuned oh, out from the rest of the conversation. Yes. So yes. oftentimes when we are battling grief in the workplace, we are tuning out from everything outside of our basic survival needs. And I think that's where people feel that that comfort of, hey, let me give you a tray of cold cuts, you know, but really it's like, what are the other basic needs that people, you know, might need? And it really just comes down to that basic question. Hey, what can I help you with? You know, I don't know how to navigate this. I've never been through this before. I've never, you know, 
been around someone who's lost someone that has been this close to me before. What can I help you with? You know, it really just comes down to that basic question. (laughs) So, and I think, and I like the way you phrase that because the, the number one thing I tell everybody, and it's the first chapter in my book, and it's the only chapter with one tip. And I often say, if you, you know, if you take nothing from this book, take this. And that is, if you need anything, let me know. It's the least helpful thing to say. Mm -hmm. Now, the way you phrased it is very different. And the reason I say it's the least helpful thing is because there's four, there's four specific reasons. One, when someone is going through this, this, this tearing of their life, right? Because that's what it is. Any type of diagnosis, any type of death, any type of depression, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rendering, right? It's just a tearing of their life the way that they thought it was going to turn out. And when they go through this, the number one thing they want is to be seen. Yes. And heard. <laughs> and heard. And I often talk about this, like imagine something really great has happened to you. Maybe you just got married or engaged. You just had a baby. You just bought a house. You just got a new job. You're so excited. This amazing thing has happened to you. And you go to lunch with five people who you know, know about this amazing thing. And no one says anything about it. Uh-huh. It feels horrible. It, it feels does. like you're not seen. It feels like, oh, it feels like you're invisible. Like, mm-hmm. It feels like you're invisible. Well, even though that's something that's good, the same thing happens when something bad happens to us. Mm-hmm. We want to be acknowledged. We don't want someone saying to us, be strong. We want someone going, huh, hell, really? That's like so we awesome. want that pause. We want someone to go, I don't know what to say. So that's the first thing is really taking that time just to acknowledge what they're going through and not brushing it off. And we'll talk a little bit later about why we don't go there. Yeah. Um, not running away from them. I think not running. Yes. You know, and I, you know, when I worked in grief and loss for all those years, the, the people who I was around that did not work in grief and loss would get uncomfortable when I would actually confront, like we yes. had a close friend that had lost um, uh, a parent. And I actually asked her flat on, what help do you need? Is there anything with funeral arrangements? Is there, you know, this? And I was being very kind of assertive in that because I knew working with grief, you get very, you are not focused oftentimes and you don't even know where to begin. But it was exactly. funny because my family and friends around me who were not used to working in grief were like, I can't believe you asked that question. I can't believe you brought up the funeral. I can't believe you did, you know, this, this and that. And I thought, well, why wouldn't you? But I think that was part of my training as well. So these are where those awkward, uncomfortable moments come in. Yes. And, and the people around you feel awkward and uncomfortable when you actually step in and, and, and say, Hey, can I help you with this? Yes. This is yes. Ex- exactly. So that is tough. So, you know? so that's, that's why that phrase is so not good. And the other thing I often say is, you know, number two is y'all, what is anything <laughs> like, you know, you just, you just offered to help me with anything. I had a toddler. Did that mean you're going to take your brand new, just cleaned BMW up to preschool to pick up my vomiting toddler? Did you mean <laughs> that by anything? Or did you mean that you were willing to drop off a bottle of wine? Anything is too big. And when you say it, this, the third reason it's not helpful when you say it, you are now asking the person who's in crisis. Yes. Whose brain is like gone. Oh, like, I, I, I refer to it. They, they're not dealing with, they don't have 52 cards in the deck. They may look like it, but they don't. And so you're asking them to break apart their day to find one thing that you might be willing to do. And the fourth reason it's not helpful is you're asking them at a time where they are in incredible and great vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but honestly, as an American, and I found this in other podcasts when I've done other parts of the world, we're not very good at going, hello, hi, my name's Kim and I need help. Yeah. And yeah. and it's That's that people pleaser mentality that we have too. So when you ask, you know, just reach out to me if you need help. A lot of people I know seeing people grieving are like, I don't want to burden anyone. I don't want to put That's that burden. Exactly I don't want it. to reach out to someone. Their life is good right now. They seem to be doing well. And I'm a Debbie Downer. Or I'm going through some difficult exactly. times. And so exactly. it really takes someone being a little, not aggressive, but just being a little bit more assertive to say, Hey, I can help you with this. Will this help right. you? <laughs> and, and that's exactly, and that's exactly what I often say. We all have helping superpowers. Do not ask me to plan a meal. I, I, I just, I get too. frozen. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> 
But I will tell you what, I'm a great grocery shopper. And if there's that one thing that you need and that grocery store hasn't had it for three weeks, I will be showing up every single day when that truck is delivered to make, get that one thing. And you so haven't we, been out of your pajamas in three weeks. Exactly. So I can go a get that for you. Exactly. So really understanding or even taking a guess at what your helping superpower is. And that's why I like what you said was, hey, do you want help planning the funeral? And then you got even more specific. You said, do you need help with a eulogy or do you want help? Like, so, or you know, flowers. We can, uh, flowers or we can make, you know, we can do the agenda. So, so it's really being very specific in the kind of help you can offer and offering more than once. And it feels uncomfortable because what if the person doesn't need the help right away? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, the story I love telling is I dedicate the book to this gentleman named Kinney. Kinney works at the Venice Farmer's Market. And when I, I used to go there every Friday after I dropped the kids off at school and Kenny, and he sold root vegetables. So it was like potatoes and sweet potatoes and whatever. And, um, and Kenny got me to try quite a few vegetables I never would have tried. And when I told him that my husband was diagnosed with cancer, Kenny's offer was, if you need anything heavy moved, let me know. And I thought that was a weird offer, honestly, because everyone I mean, kept saying, <laughs> if you need anything, if you need anything, if you need anything. And what turns out, it was a fantastic offer because it was really specific. And he offered, what I didn't tell you was he offered more than once. So I knew that he was the person to go to if I needed this one thing done. And one of the things I often say, when you offer more than once, you may feel like you're being a burden, but please remember again, that person is not dealing with a full deck of cards. It's and true. so you may have offered once and they're not gonna remember. So offer three, four, five times. Don't offer every day. Yeah. Don't be calling them every hour every being like, day. remember I'm your grocery <laughs> shopper. Like, you know, that don't, don't get obsessive about it, but just, you know, stop by the, their desk and say, hey, just a reminder, I've got the agenda ready for you. If you want me to do it, I'm happy to do the meeting for that agenda, or I'm happy to call the client for you to take over these three things. Or, you know, I prepared this slide deck. Here's some pieces you might want to use in your presentation, whatever it is, but be specific and offer more than once. Yeah. And they, I think they Kim, that's so important you. because when I worked with grieving families, we would have to tell, we would have to do the death notification. And so we had to say your loved one has died at least, well, some, some of them would grasp that and understand it because maybe they were process, processing it over months, but it's the trauma uh, uh, families that we had studies show they don't really process it until 14 times that you have oh, yeah. actually said so-and-so has died and you have to use certain terminology because you could say it three or four times and they adjust it's just going in one ear and out the other because they're worried about um how am i going to take care of the dog how am i going to do this how am i going to do that how you know what do i need to deal with at this person's work you know it's like just flooding in one ear and out the other so i love that you're bringing that up because there's a, there's a fine line between nagging someone and there's also a fine line between being present and in the moment with offering what you can give, you know, to, to the person who's going through the crisis. Exactly. And I think that's, let's bring it back to the first one, which I said is, you know, the discomfort, right? Because you can't fix it. And we as Americans love to believe that we can fix anything. Yeah, we can we make it, I mean, you know, and so when we can't fix it, we feel powerless. And that is a really uncomfortable place to be. In addition, what normally happens to all those people who didn't say or do anything to have support are usually terrified that they 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 turn it around and make it about themselves and they don't do it in a in a in a mean way but they think what if i say the wrong thing what if i make her cry right and so in that fear of saying the wrong thing of causing an emotion they think crying is bad when in the beginning uh, you know i can attest after death crying is really a relief it they're so worried about that that they freeze and they don't, so it's really hard. And, and I think it's a normal reaction. And sometimes I still have that reaction. It's a normal reaction to go into fear of like, I don't want to cause any more harm. Yeah. But the harm that you cause by not doing anything is way more powerful than the harm you could cause by saying the wrong thing. I've had people said the wrong thing to me. I've said the wrong thing to people. And I've been able to go back and say, 
Yeah. You know, when I said, if you need anything, let me know. I was totally making it about you and putting all the pressure on you. And I'm really sorry about that. So here's what I can do. I'm happy to pick up your son every Friday at 3 p.m. I'm really happy to do that and bring him to my house and have a play day. You let me know. And then on Friday, I call in the morning, say, do you want me to pick up George? Because I'm So it's, you know, you get the opportunity to touch into your own humanity if you said the wrong thing and come back and say, I'm sorry, I made it about me and now I want to make it about you. And you can even do that if you haven't said anything, but it just feels like it's sometimes a, a longer bridge to walk. Yeah. And let's talk about that, Kim, what not to say in these situations, you know, what, what terminology, you know, and, and I can kind of, um, you know, kind of hone in on what I, you know, personally, I haven't experienced too much grief and loss. I lost my grandmother a couple years back, but I witnessed many people, I, thousands of people pass and I witnessed many grieving families. So in your experience, what were some things that people would say to you that you were like, oh, that is not helpful or that is not what I want to hear? So I'll give, so first of all, I have a free download on my website, which gives you the four, uh, there's five things never to say to anyone dealing with anything. And I have those all up there. So you're happy to download those, but I'll give you one that someone said to me, uh, I was young when my husband died and someone meaning well about a month after he died said, you know, Kim, I, you know, don't worry too much. You're young, you're easy on the eyes and you'll get, you can get remarried. Ouch. And I know where they were coming from. They were coming from don't lose hope. And I was, you know, it was a month after I was feeling, I was, you know, really, really skinny, out of my mind, crazy, um, just feeling really hopeless, wondering if my life was even worth living. I mean, this is a man that I had married who was a co-parent. So he wasn't, you know, it wasn't just me, you know, it's just, so anyway, I, I don't mean, I don't need to validate. System. Yeah. He was a support system. Um, and she meant, well, she meant for me to kind of don't lose hope, but it really hurt. I was like, so, oh, you're right. I have nothing to worry about. Why am I grieving? I'm young. Let me see on the eyes. I get remarried. Yeah. You know, unvalidated so, your, your feelings. And exactly. What you're going exactly. Okay. Another thing that often people say, and they mean well, is like, stay strong, be strong. You got this. Those two Power to three through. word, mm -hmm. these two to three have courage, you know, um, and sometimes I will have a caveat. Sometimes those are really helpful, but within context of a conversation, it's almost like people did that. They did a mic drop. They're like, stay strong, mic drop. Woo. I said what I need to say. I've done my part. Right. <laughs> And so hashtag do, grief strong, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so when you say those things, what you're doing is you're diminishing everything that they're going through, which is hard. Look, and it's stuffing not, emotions and stuffing emotions. <laughs> Look, it is not easy to watch people in pain. If you have children, we all know that or a really good friend. It's horrific. All you want to do is fix it. You want to make it better. And, and it stays with you, right? You're cooking dinner and you're thinking you start to cry because so-and-so's mother has cancer because so-and-so has cancer and you feel for them. It is not a fun journey to go into pain with someone, but it is so important. It allows you to be empathetic. It, is. it opens you up and you become a resource for them instead of someone that they clearly know that they cannot talk to. Yes. Right. And it's so important understanding the difference between empathy and sympathy. And, you know, I, I usually talk about a visual with this. It's almost like the person grieving or going through crisis is in a pit. Okay. And there's a ladder there. All right. So well, someone who's sympathetic. That's funny. Brene, Brene Brown does that yes, video on that. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And it's like someone who's sympathetic is going to look down and yell out, Hey, you know, is there anything that you need down there? Here's a sandwich or here's this and just kind of drop it down there where an empathetic person will take the time to walk down that ladder, sit with that person and just be there and be present. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult to be that empathetic person because especially if you've gone through crisis yourself, oftentimes you will get triggered being there with someone who's also going through crisis as well. And so really, it's just like you said in the beginning, we want to be heard and we want to be seen. And that's really all it takes. Oftentimes, we don't have to say anything. Hi, I'm here. I'm a listening ear. What do you want to talk about today? 
Right. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's literally just telling them a story of what's happening in your life right now, yeah. you know, sometimes, but it, it is being present. And I often, you know, I talk about the word triggered um, sometimes because people feel like triggering is bad, mm -hmm. but triggering is an opportunity to look at what's triggering you and to go and walk through it. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, I talk to young widows a lot, you know, I'm the, I'm now the widow go-to person with um, among my friends. And, and, you know, it pains me to hear them in the first couple months. All I want to do is like take over their grief because I know how this works. I know how it operates. I can get them through. I'll drop you back into this three years out. Um, it is really painful. And it also allows me the opportunity to process you know, sometimes I kind of smooth over the part that my husband died. I'm kind of like, yeah, I mean, it happened 13 years ago. It happened, yada, 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 yada. And sometimes I need to acknowledge that and say, you know what, Kim, that was a big deal in your life. <laughs> and it and it still has effects in your life now. And it's okay to cry about it because you. I remember the pain. I remember feeling so lost. And so that's, you know, so that's the trigger part. And then there was something else you said. Um, yeah, sympathy. So one thing about empathy that people often get wrong, and I think this happens mostly in the workplace, people think that empathy means no boundaries. Yes. And empathy is the number one thing you need to create really good boundaries because it allows you to understand where they're coming from. And um, so really quick, the second part of my process, the first part is knowing what to say, which we just went into. But the second part is dealing with your feelings and your stereotypes. Because we all have stereotypes based on the, our own personal experience, a lot of them based on TV. What is it like to have cancer? Well, on TV, if you have cancer, you go bald, you lose your eyebrows, you're nauseous all the time, you need someone, you know, you, you know, and even on Instagram. And then we you see, do a, a Susan G. Co a Susan Coleman marathon. Ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> and even on Instagram, I cannot tell you how tired I am of seeing this, you know, the woman who's getting her hair shaved because of chemo and then the yeah. son, you know, whips it out and starts shaving his own head. And, and in the moment for them, it's very meaningful, but there's this image out there that we have of cancer. There's an image out there of what we have about what loss is. And the interesting and thing how about- how we grieve. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And the interesting thing is that image of how we grieve is not very well developed mm -hmm. because I have people up to me is like, how are you doing? And I'm like, it's been 13 years. Like, I'm pretty sure there's nothing in my closet that my husband would even recognize if he came back to life right now. Like, you know, so they, they immediately think that I'm still in grief or that I can't, when I say, I think about him every day, they assume that that means that I sadness. think about him in sadness every day. Right. So, so we have all these stereotypes in our head and we need to re get them out of our head and onto paper before we move forward to helping. And this goes through both either through managers and also through individuals. Because one, because the fact that, you know, I've heard people, I've had friends who've had cancer who they haven't lost their hair, they haven't lost weight. They they don't, you never know they had cancer by looking at them, but they're still dealing with the ramifications of this thing in their body that could kill them if they don't treat it. Um, and so and so there's this, there's this idea of, well, she looks fine. Yes, she does look fine, but she's still having cancer, it's a mask. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I expect someone who has died, I expect them to, or who's grieving to kind of be better in six months. It was six months ago. Haven't you moved past that? Or a year, a year is a big marker. I think this mostly comes from the Jewish tradition where you put the headstone up at the end of a year. And so when you do that, there's this idea that after a year, you're done. You're done. Like you're done. You're done. You and you know, even civil in the um in the Civil War era, before you know, you wore you you gradually move from black mm -hmm. to purple to being able to wear lighter colors by the end of the year. So there's this whole thing about this year. A year is not enough time. A year's not enough. So anyway, back to my point. Um, <laughs> I could go on this. So just take the time to deal with your stereotypes and your own fears, your own, your own, you know, for me, cancer is very scary because my husband died. Is that true for everybody? Heck no. Thank goodness. But taking the time to really acknowledge what you're going through and your own stereotypes is a really important part because that mixed with the empathy allows you to come up with some really good ideas of how to support somebody. Yeah. And also understanding that everyone grieves dif differently. And I definitely saw this firsthand working in the trauma units. You know, I think for me, it was more concerning the people who were not showing any emotion. They were just bottling it up like pressure cookers. 
But I was kind of that type of person. I didn't like to show emotion in a professional environment or in front of others. So I would break down on the car ride home or, you know, on my own time alone. And so, you know, but then there was the weeping family, you know, members. And then there was the really obvious wailing, wailing. And those were the ones that the staff would actually get scared of. And I'm like, no, those are the ones who are actually processing their emotions and they're moving through that process. I was more concerned about the ones who were not showing, you know, any emotion because it was just like, I was like, okay, let's bring in a chaplain. Let's bring in a social worker, you know, just to help, you know, move them through. And this was in the hospital setting, not necessarily after they leave the hospital. So let's talk a little bit about that too, Kim, that scenario where, okay, you've moved through the death and then people kind of come and go for the next week or two. And then that passes. And then no one's offering help anymore. No one, everyone went away. You know, how do you, as someone who's either going through a crisis, you know, whether it be cancer or some sort of dis-ease or even a loss for that matter, reach out and ask for help? How do you do that? Because that's the flip side of us, us as the person witnessing or observing someone going through a crisis. How do you you as a person in crisis, ask for assistance, ask for support. That is great. It takes a huge amount of courage. I will tell you that. Um, I remember when my husband was first diagnosed and they needed to start chemo right away. So they, he'd had surgery. Um, there was a, there was actually a tumor in his body. He had surgery, had it removed and they couldn't even, the cancer was so advanced that they couldn't even wait for five, for they couldn't even wait for the wound to heal. Usually, like the wound to heal before they needed to get it going. So, he had surgery on Friday. They started chemo on Sunday, and I remember calling my friend and saying, "I need help. I don't even know what or anything, but this is gonna mess with our lives. I don't even know what I need. Can you come?" And she left work and she came up and we kind of put together a list of things I needed help. So I think that there is a, I think this is where, so the message of my book and the message to everyone who listens is I want people to really know how much they matter. And this is on both sides. People want to help you. They do. They're waiting for instruction, which you are ill-equipped to give. And so, you may not even know what you need support with. Well, that's that's a whole thing. That's exactly it. You're ill-equipped to give because you don't even know what it is. But there is one person out there who you can call and to say, I need help. I don't even know what it is. Can we please sit down and just brainstorm, right? Maybe, Maybe it's your boss that you go into work and you say, I need help. I don't know how. Can we brainstorm? Can we talk about this? Because trying to do this by ourselves, and I think this is sort of a bigger community thing. I don't think we're, I don't think we're intuitive by ourselves. I think we're intuitive, and we're much more intuitive with other people. And you know, so it's checking in, it's understanding, it's talking with people, it's it's communicating. It's and I use that. I hate that word because it's just so big. But it's really expressing yourself with other people. But everyone around you, they want to help. They just don't know how. And really, you have two choices. You can do this alone, which is you have these expectations. We all have expectations. My favorite saying is expectations are resentment under construction. Interesting. So we have these expectations of how people should show up for us. And then people don't do it. And then we get resentment. So now you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with, the grief, the the depression, the cancer, the whatever it is. Now you're dealing with that and resentment because people didn't show up how you expected them to show up. The only thing is you didn't give them a map. And then the other side, or you can do the other side, which is take a moment, allow yourself to be vulnerable and ask someone who you know is safe. And a lot of people say, I don't have anyone who's safe in my life. And I'm going to call bull Mm -hmm. because most of us do have people who are safe in our lives. We just haven't acknowledged it. Right. And maybe they're not the person that you go to and talk about your dating life with because they're going to go blab it all over. But maybe they're the person who has been through loss themselves and they get how devastating this is. And they're the person, they're the person who you wouldn't even think of. It could be that coworker that works in a completely different department that lost a child or lost a spouse or a family member. And you have never really 
had a deep, meaningful conversation with them, but you're like, Hey, I know you've been through this and I know you can probably empathize with me. I need some support. You know, where do I start? Where do I start? Where do I start? So that's what I would advise. And it is scary. I mean, I would love to say, you just, just go in there and just ask, you can do it. But it's, it's not that easy. It's terrifying. And I had my one person, I didn't call my mother-in-law. I didn't think that she'd be helpful to me. I didn't call some friends because I was too afraid of being vulnerable with them. But I had had this relationship with this person. We spent a lot of time talking to each other. And and I was terrified of asking her. I said, can you come up? I I asked her to leave work and come to me and help. That's a big ask. And I was fully prepared for her to say no, but I call you in an hour during lunch. Uh But she understood. She knew that this was not something simple. This was, we need to go. I need to go up. I need to be present. I need to be with her. So she did it. She left work. Um, I was terrified. I didn't go like, so it's, it. you know, in this moment when you are feeling the most bereft for whatever reason, you know, find the courage to find that one person and ask. And again, I love your example of it's the coworker who lost a child three years ago. That person gets it, right? It's it's the person, it's the 25-year-old who had testicular cancer. Yeah, it's the good cancer because there's such a high, but it's still cancer. Exactly. Like, he's still and freaked that's a, out that's about it. Type in itself, the, yes. the, the prostate cancer. The, when my dad got prostate, it was like, yeah. This is the good cancer. This is yeah. the cancer everyone dies with, you know, yeah. and they have other reasons why they die. And I'm like, that's yeah. not helping me right now. You know, no, no, so- no. Cancer is cancer. The person was just told yes. if they don't do anything, they don't do any type of intervention, they will die. That's what cancer is. So whether you have stage zero or you stage one cancer, you, they just caught it. It's a small little thing. They can remove it. You're done. You still feel the same way. So if you know someone who has cancer, you probably do. There's there's people online who you could reach out to and say, this is what I need. How I don't know what to do, right? There's a ton of grief support out there as well. I think the thing, it's really easy to isolate right now because it feels, it's just simpler to isolate. You just figure it out. You'll figure out the groceries. You'll make it work. You'll just, you'll just isolate. Um, it is simpler, but it is not easier. It's not. And I think sometimes too, it's important for us to look at who are our, who's our support. You know, like you said, I, I wasn't reaching out to my mother-in-law or, or anybody really close to the rawness of, of the loss. Sometimes it's best for us to reach out to someone outside of that box because they have a stronger structure, a stronger support there. Because when we reach out to people who are also their their cup is empty you know just as our cup is yes, empty yes. what are we what what are we we're trying to siphon from a drought you know right, and it's right, like right, we've right. got to reach out to people so when you're thinking of your list of safe people think of people that have structure as well that have that stability that can step in that aren't you know you know, it could be someone who, yes, they were close to the person that you knew, but not in the rawness of it. Exactly. That are also going through the deep stages of grief. Just exactly. So yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Exactly. You know, so immediate family may not be the people who, who you reach out to. Now I will say this, my middle sister took over the whole meal thing and she and my friend, two friends got it all together and organized and and meals started showing up. So, you know, but, but that's a very structured thing that she was, that she was happy to take control over. And And it was helping her heal too, I bet. And it was absolutely, oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she, I mean, she was 3000 miles away, you know, talk about feeling powerless. And that's hard when you're far away. And like, for me, I was in uh, North Idaho and my grandmother passed in Western New York and I felt helpless. I felt, what can I do? And eventually I got there, you know, eventually uh, several months later, but in the moment I felt helpless. And so I just kind of asked my dad, you know, what can I do from a distance? Is there anything that I can do to help? And he said, well, if, you know, can I, if I can send you some paperwork, can you read this over? Can you do this? And so 
there, I do feel when you're at a distance like that, you do feel helpless, but there are things that you can do. So it's Absolutely. Com coming back to our yeah. initial uh, piece where, you know, just say, okay, here, here are some ideas of some things that I can help with. You know, let me, let me take some control, you know, of this, yep. or take this off of your plate because your plate seems really full right now. Well, that's, and it's funny because that's number three. So I have this strategy called the North Star strategy. The first one is just say something, right? Talk, say, acknowledge. The second one is deal with your own feelings, deal with your feelings and your stereotypes. The third one is assess, take an assessment. What can you do? Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a helping from a distance and I have in my book organized in categories. So there's food, kids, entertainment, and long distance help. And there is a chapter called send lawyers, guns, and money, you know, from the, from the Z, from the Z bond, I forgot the the song. Um, help but in healthcare, that's another thing. Exactly. Like you the Maybe you exactly. have a friend who deals with blue cross and blue shield and, exactly. and they, they exactly. live exactly you know, across the country, they can help. Those are exactly. things that we can do. Exactly. Exactly. You can have someone look over your bills. E errors happen. And all of a sudden you're paying more than you should be paying. You have someone look over your healthcare bills. You can have someone take care of like, you know, if, if someone's willing, you know, it was like, I just, I can't remember to pay my cell phone bill. I'll send you money. Yes. I'll send you like uh, X amount of lump of money. Can you just pay it for me? Right. So there's tons of things that you can do. And that simple thing, Y'all paying a bill yeah. is huge. And it makes a huge, even funeral it's arrangements, huge. like, you know, hey, I'll help with the eulogy. I can do that from a distance. Hey, yes. I can help arrange a crematory service. I yes. can do that from a distance, yes. you know? Yes. And, and I want to talk about things people can do from the distance from a long term perspective yes. too, because what happens is like you alluded to it, is that we end up, you know, the first, usually first three months, people are in the live. They're in there, they're doing things, they're helping, they're helping. And then help fades out. You have some stragglers at six months, maybe two or three people, and then they fade out. And all of a sudden a year you're out by yourself. So if you are a person who has not helped somebody in the past three months, it's not too late. And I really want to stress this. I had a friend show up with a meal first time in nine months. I was so happy to see her. Right. Yeah, because so all the meals no... come in the first two weeks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, really, um, there's no such thing as too late to help, especially when there's grief, um, when there's loss. That's a really important thing to remember. Um, I also recommend sometimes people celebrate anniversaries. Yes. And yes, it feels weird to celebrate a death anniversary. And I know there's a different word for it. Um, celebration and, of life anniversary. Uh, so, yeah, celebration. But there was a there's a there's a Jewish word for it that's really perfect for it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know it, and I'm sure there's other words in other languages that aren't as scary of de uh, scared as death as, as, as we final. are. Yeah. Um, so I think really understanding that you know I'm really sorry this just honoring I'm really sorry this happened in your life. I just want to honor that. I'm really sorry this has happened in your life. Um, and I remember, I remember the rift. I remember this moment. That's such a great way to honor somebody. So don't be, don't be worried about, you know, if you didn't help with funeral arrangements in the beginning, there are things that you can do six months, nine months, a year, a year and a half later that will be really meaningful and helpful. And you can always redeem yourself. Be like, listen, I was having, a, you know, I had just lost someone in my life. And when you lost your husband, it was hard for me to reach out to you at that time. But I've healed. I've seen you've been healing. What can I do to help now? Right. Or even you know? just let me, let me take you to dinner and let's talk about all the different ways that I can help you. Or because what I, have you I, been through? Let's talk about that. Yes, together. exactly. Exactly. You know, my, my cousin um, lived in this, there was this ranch. She still has it. It is still there. A 90 acre, beautiful ranch and sheep and horses and, you know, dogs and cats and my kids. It's where my kids learn to, you know, shoot guns and chain, you work with chainsaws and ride ATVs. <laughs> and we, you know, we, we took the kids there as much as we possibly could could. And she couldn't come down. She couldn't help us. But what she did do was she would share stories about what was happening at the ranch. Yeah. 
you know, and my husband loved those stories, you know, so even, even after he got better and it took us, it took us several months after he was done to deal with the side effects of the chemo that he had had for us to even be able to make it to the ranch. So even after he was done with cancer the first time, he, she continued to share those stories with us and they were fantastic. So don't, don't ever think that there's like this big action you have to take. Sometimes sharing the funny stories of your own life, like you're never going to believe what happened to me yesterday, <laughs> and just sharing the humor of it is absolutely exactly what that person needs because everyone's calling them and going, oh, yeah, yeah. you want some normalcy in your you life. You want some right? normalcy in your life. And obviously you don't want to be doing it all like, you know, you don't want to be like, oh my God, this guy I'm dating. <laughs> yeah, He's like dumping all your garbage you on someone. <laughs> exactly. But you do want to share funny stories about things that are happening in your life because it gives them a break and it reminds them that there's something outside of, the, of, of this whole horrible thing that's happening to them right now. Absolutely. And that, that is so important. And it's really just bringing in that, that energy, that frequency, you know, of, you know, Hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm a funny person and I've got some funny stuff going on in my life. I'd like to share that with you. And, you know, I think too, on the flip side though, I did, I would recognize during the grieving process, those types of people trying to be sarcastic or trying to enlighten yes. or lift the mood. And it actually yes going back to what not to do and what not to say, it actually yes. was causing more stress and uh, suffering on the person grief, yes. you know, going through the grief when you are trying to make light or, but that's also shining back on that person of their uncomfortability yes. in that moment. Yes. Y'all yeah. you're, you're discomfort with the subject. You're not fooling or hiding from anybody. And I yeah. think that's the thing that we think that somehow we're like, Oh no, I'm fine. No, you're not. Everyone can tell. And yes. I talk to managers about this all the time. If you don't deal with your feelings, your team knows how you were feeling about that person, how uncomfortable you are just by the tone that you use when you talk about them. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, you, you, you're not fooling anybody except maybe yourself. And so that's why it's so important to get that stuff out of your head. So you go through the assessment, you figure out what you're good at, figure out where you're willing to help. Like I said, you don't have to jump into, you don't have to do whatever it is you're willing to do for 35 straight days. There's no need for that. The simplest things people do are really, really helpful. And that's where you start to take the thoughtful action. So you take the action. You say, hey, look, I know that you have to do this agenda every week. And I know you used to complain about not liking to do it. So I'm happy to take that off your plate for the next two weeks. Let's see where it goes. Can you show me what your process was so I can do a good job, right? Absolutely. So you're just, just unburdening them. Um, if you're a manager, look, the person is probably not going to be able to work at the pace that they're working at, whether they're grieving or whether they're not. That's where you have the honest conversation. I know your husband just died. And you're back at work and you have to get out of the head that you don't think that they should be work, right? Because that's that's none of your business. But I really want to help you be successful. I know how important work is to you. Let's take a look at the projects that you have on your platelets right now. And let's figure out which ones you're willing to let go for a little bit and which ones you really want to work on right now. And let's figure out what you can do because grief, although it's invisible, messes with your mind. That person's going to be spacey. They're going to be short tempered. They're going to be, they're going to laugh inappropriately. They're going to cry inappropriately. They're going to, they're, they might have emotional mm -hmm. outbursts. Exactly. So they're going to be erratic. So your job as a manager is to help them find the stability that they can at work. And so that the, they know, you know, erratic on the way to work, erratic on the way back to work, but they know that they've got this thing to do. They can focus at work on this thing. It's a gift to them. Do not pull all the projects from them, waiting for them to get through grief. Because when you do that, the message you send is two things. One, okay. when you're having a difficulty, you can't handle anything. And two, the rest of the team notices and they're like, okay, note to self, don't tell the manager that I'm getting divorced. Don't tell the manager these things are happening because he or she is going to pull stuff from me that I need as my lifeline. And I think that's the thing that people forget. Your team or you Work is really important to us. It makes us feel, hopefully, it makes us feel like we're doing something good. And it doesn't matter whether you're sweeping the floor of a hospital room or chucking packages, you know, a UPS or the, not, not chucking, carefully handling all those packages of UPS, or you're running an organization. We all get something from work. 
And when you as a manager try to pull that away from them, you are actually causing more harm than you are good when you're dealing with an employee. And that's the same thing for a friend. Don't go in and remove things from your friends. I'll take care of that. I'll do that. Because it's really important that your friend have some things that they can do, that they can experience some successes with it. So if they're really good at cooking and they really, really enjoy cooking, sure, maybe cooking every night isn't going to do well for them. But if they say they want to cook one meal a week, then help them buy the ingredients yeah. for that one so they can cook that one meal. But it's really important that we don't go in with this kind of martyrdom, I'm going to take control, I'm going to take it over for you and remove it from you. And then the last step is really taking the time to reflect, right? So as a person is grieving at work, they're able to do more and more and more. And then in six months, they might hit a spot where they're like, they can't do anything. So it's just constantly checking in. And this is where being a good friend is really important is yeah, you did that one thing and you helped out. And maybe it's been three months since you've been in contact, but contact them again, it's okay. Say, hey, you know, I was thinking about you the other day and I came across these beautiful sunflowers and I wanted to know if I can drop them off at your house. Are you okay with having like things you have to take care of in the house? Because after Art died, I didn't want many loving things. Living I didn't things. want, people kept wanting to give me plants. And I was like, nope, don't want to take anything I have to take care That's of. It's so funny what people think you that know. you, you know, that you're like, oh, this might be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, so that's adding to my plate, <laughs> that's adding to my plate right now. It's adding to the guilt. And I took care of him, you know, tried to keep him alive and it didn't work. So a little sore spot for me right now. Um, well, I think so, too, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's really just saying, Hey, I can do this for you, but following with, would that be helpful? For yes, you? Giving yes. the person the power to say, you know what? No, actually, I appreciate you offering that, but I've got this right now and I can do this. Or, you know what? That would be really helpful. Can you please take over that project for or, me? Or not that, but there's something else. Like you give them, when you offer, you're giving them, you, and when you offer often, which is often to say, you're giving them permission, you're showing up and they know that you're someone who will help. And so even if it's, even if what you're offering isn't what they need, they might ask you to do something else that's, that's adjacent to what you can do. So exactly. you would feel comfortable. So, yeah, I just think it's, yes, yes. What you just said. Yes. And, and I think as managers too, and employees brushing up on compassion fatigue, what that means, yes. what that looks like having a deeper understanding of when someone is a caregiver. I had a very close friend when I was uh, working in donation. She, her husband had gotten um, a late stage prostate cancer diagnosis and he was going into hospice care and she was overwhelmed. I mean, I was overwhelmed just doing our job myself without having uh, some to take care of someone with cancer. And so it really got down to, you know, just really asking her, what, what do you need help with? Here's what I can do. You know what I can do here. we do. And she was like, here, take this project, do this. I can do this. You can do and so me just visualizing her going through that, but I was also witnessing my team members not really offering that support. So I, as a team member, kind of pulled them aside and said, hey guys, you know, so-and-so is going through this right now. And I don't want you all to bombard her today because she's going to know that I just pulled y'all aside. <laughs> right? Don't look <laughs> now. Obvious, right? <laughs> but I want, you know, maybe once a week, uh, you know, maybe you this week reach out to her, you next week reach out to her, you next week, you know, so it was like, I kind of set up a little schedule, a rotating weekly schedule for each of them. There you go. You know, to kind of yep. just not make it obvious that we were offering help because she's the, she's the independent one, you know, but she was coming to me because she felt I was the safe place, you know? And so I think too, as the safe person too, just being thinking outside of the box and saying, okay, maybe I can't help with all of this, but maybe I have some connections with others who can help too, you know, yes. to make this a little I bit more I think that efficient. is so very, very important. Look, my friends didn't, didn't, they didn't come to me. A lot of them came to me individually, but a lot of them that, you know, there's a circle, you have a circle of friends who can help you figure out what you need and help and help get the information out. And that's another piece that happens during the assessment is really understanding who do you want to tell, especially at work? Who do you want to know about this? You don't have to reveal that you have stage four cancer at work. You don't. You can just reveal that you're sick and you're not going to be at work anymore, or you're going to be work three days a week or whatever. So there's so many things that you can talk about. I did want to talk about compassion fatigue because the other side of it 
is sometimes people at work take on too much. You get in the moment and you're like, I just want to help. And so you take on all these projects away from this person. You're going to do it all and you're going to really help and you're going to get in there. And then and it's then you get month, busy. four weeks <laughs> and in four weeks and you are Burned exhausted <laughs> and you're pissed because other people haven't volunteered to help, but that's because you seem to have it all under control. Yeah. And now you're mad at your manager because your manager isn't recognizing that he isn't having to recognize that you're doing all this extra work. So as a manager, it's really important to watch for team members who tend to, who will love to take on all that extra work because they're taking it on for other reasons. They want to be helpful, but they're taking it. Sometimes they take on too much and then that can cause other issues within the team. The team feels like, oh, I don't have to do anything because Tanya's got it all wrapped up. But then Tanya's getting resentful and stressed out and burnt out and frustrated. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And it's also something that happens in managers. Managers will take on the employee's extra work instead of figuring out what team members can help out with that. And then they get compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. So it is a real thing. Thing, and it can really harm delegating. relationships. Yeah. It can harm, yeah, it can harm relationships. It can harm, um, you know, work relationships. It can harm your turnover rate. It can harm employee engagement. I mean, it can harm productivity. So um, yeah, that's, I'm really glad you brought that up because it's yeah. something I often forget to talk and about. And not a lot of people speak up about that. You know, for me, it was like, I would take on, take on, take on, and then I'd have a yearly review. And then I would dump everything on my boss at the yearly review. And she would be like, whoa, you're a satellite employee. I didn't even really know all of this was going on. But yet exactly. the whole time I'm talking to my other satellite coordinators, they they com- they completely understood what was happening. But yet my boss was in the dark, you know, on yeah. all of this because I was not in the physical office that she was in and I didn't have those opportunities. She would not check in. Uh, she was, what I loved about that, she gave me autonomy, but on the, the flip side of that, she wasn't very engaged, you know, right. with that. So it's so important. And I love that you brought that up because we are touching on many different duality polarities in, in this podcast today. And so, but I do want to lead into your 100 acts of love. And I want to talk about this consultancy that you put together and uh, how it started and how, uh, how it's grown and what it's all about. Yeah. So I originally started wanting to help individuals to, you know, just show up for their friends. I really, it meant it was so, such a powerful experience for myself, my husband and our children that I really wanted people to show up. And like I said, I went back to work and I realized that there was this, this place where managers were ill-equipped, HR teams are ill-equipped. You know, usually when an employee is dealing with a difficulty, um, they'll go to HR or HR will come to them and say, okay, well, you can do, you know, leave of absence, FMLA or, you know, you can do um, bereavement leave, which legally, this is when things really makes me mad. Legally, a company only needs to give someone three days. Okay. Could you imagine that your husband hard. dies and you have to come back to work three days later? And there are companies who are like, so sad, too bad. Mm-hmm. You know, too bad, so sad. Um, and I know that, you know, Facebook and I believe it's MasterCard have all expanded it to 20 days, but even that is not quite enough. Mm-hmm. So you have this, 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 you know, 20 days or three days, or you have an employee who's, you know, dealing with cancer and is out two days a week. And the manager is just left to do whatever they can do to make it work. And we don't, sometimes the employee's out for a short period of time. Sometimes it's surgery and they're back in. And sometimes it's months. Sometimes it's six months. Sometimes it's a year. You know, so the manager's left to figure it out. And as always, you know, you'll see upper management gets coaches, they get the training, they get all this other stuff, and middle management gets very little. We talk about making sure our managers have really good tools, but we're not very good at giving them the tools that they need. And this was just an area that I saw thought was just, you know, empty. A stat I came upon, 46% of those who are diagnosed with cancer are between the ages of 25 and 64. Those are prime working years. That's significant, yes. You know, no, those are people aren't like you know the person who has cancer That's isn't that... working and then after you're retired exactly <laughs> exactly yeah. and with retirement ages growing like they're growing up where yeah. the people aren't retiring at 64 anymore so you've got a workforce that if they have not dealt with someone with cancer because remember it's what's the stat one in three one and two if you're a man mm-hmm. so if you have not dealt with an employee with cancer it's just a matter of time Mm-hmm. Right. And so the fact that we are ill prepared, um, you know, um, um, Twitch's suicide, 
really, really brought that home. Now, he wasn't. The Ellen Show had stopped by then. But suicide happens every single day to people who are working, right? One day your coworker is there, the next day they're not, and you learn that they took their life. Mm -hmm. The ramifications of that on a team are ignored. This company will be like, okay, like I've seen a company, one company did this incredible thing. They hired a bus. This gentleman, he was a, he was a um, upper level, an executive, and his father died. And employees wanted to go to the service. So they hired a bus that picked employees up at work, took them to the service, waited at the service and bought them back. Like that's an amazing thing to do. But what next? Yeah. What next? Mm -hmm. Right? So these employees are now dealing with this desk or someone has to go to the home and pick up the equipment. They have to deal with who, what projects this person was working on, how they pick up the slack. And there's this incredible sadness. Like a void. Mm-hmm. A void, right? And no one's, to, may, maybe the company will bring in a grief counselor. Mm-hmm. And I am, I will tell you this, I am not a fan of grief counselors for immediacy. I am a fan of grief counselors when it comes to Long-term. something like suicide. Mm-hmm. And I am a fan of grief counselors if you're going to put them in place and let them stay there for weeks on end. Yes. Because not just a couple grief, of days. Not yes. just a couple of days. They bring a couple of days and then they're like, okay, the grief counselors are gone. Well, great. My grief is my grief just surfaced yes. yesterday <laughs> and the grief counselor is now gone. So 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 if a hotline. I mean I guess yeah. the hotlines are good too, but not everyone will call or feel comfortable on a hotline. Uh, hotlines or some type of system where you've got people who are accessible to talk about it because you may be going in at work and on a zoom call that this person's supposed to be and it may be four weeks later and you may be like you know what y'all i gotta turn my camera off because i'm sitting here crying and i'm missing this person because i'm used to seeing their their little square on the zoom call you know And, and i'm scared i'm scared because my son you know, threatened to commit suicide or my brother committed suicide or, you know, I'm feeling hopeless because I'm thinking about doing the same thing, Mm -hmm. right? So, so there's this incredible amount of isolation that occurs when a team member commits suicide, but no one knows what to do or what to say and, and how to, how to help a team through that. So I think that that's, you know, those are, life doesn't happen outside of work and it is time, especially now when we are focusing a lot on mental health and well-being in an organization that managers have have the tools to really deal with these really difficult, hard, not taught at at Harvard Business School Mm -mm. stuff, right? So how do you deal with this? Because there's two folds, right? There's you, there's your, there's three, there's you, there's a team, there's a company Uh and what weaving yourself in between those is, is something that people need support and help with. And that's what, that's where my passion is. We could have a whole podcast where I could talk about that. (laughs) And that's, that's excellent, Kim. And, you know, I worked for a company that every single day we dealt with grief and loss and we didn't even have the tools within our team, our upper management, our middle management within our, our, our employee team to even deal with this. We didn't have, um, yeah, we had the hotline. Yeah, we had this, but we didn't even have, and we were dealing with grief and loss on an exponential level than, uh, and say like a Verizon or, you know, a MasterCard, you know, we were dealing with this, uh, every single day. I mean, I was watching people being extubated from ventilators, like at least six or seven times a week, you know, I mean, this was very common for me to see death. It almost became very normal. I I was around death more than I was around living, you know, at a certain extent. And, you know, and then many of our, our staff going in and talking to the grieving families. And then how are they processing that? You know, because they're the they're being the stable one in those conversations, you know, and so there's so much that needs to be done from uh, a societal level across the board, hospital systems, having the, these these programs in place, like these programs that you've put together, working with human resources and and having, um, build, I guess, bridging those silos. There were so many silos, you know, yeah. within our organization. Yeah. And you know, uh, tears. You know, Tanya, yeah. it's so funny. This just reminded me. So um, my husband gifted my kids and I the ability to say goodbye. 
And I really do. I was there. I got to watch him take his last breath. And that was something that horrified me. And I am forever, ever, ever grateful that I got mm -hmm. to do. Aww. But I brought the kids <laughs> in. Oh, I brought the kids in to say goodbye to their dad. And my daughter, she was nine years old and she just wailed and she kept saying it over and over daddy 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 and there was a nurse in the room and the nurse started to sob and I remember at the time being first a little kind of pissed off I was like you know you are the professional here yeah. there is no sobbing coming from you. This, is already, <laughs> this is already hard enough and then realizing right this is really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. And I I remember she was in the and room. And it never gets easy, Cam. No, no. Not. And she and she was in the room. She was like doing something with my, I think we were like adding more morphine to him or something. So she wasn't, she was doing something in there. And I just thought, oh my gosh, how heartbreaking that must have been for her mm -hmm. to watch this little girl, you know, wail for her father. Yeah. And just, you know, how hard that must have been for her. And so, yeah, I mean, they're there. I don't know how she dealt with it. I don't, did she walk out and walk to the desk and tell everyone she needed a break? Or did she just, you know, we had this kind of space, there was a room and then there was a space Did she kind of sit there for a second. Did she go into the other room and just cry and, and put her game face back However out? However you got to do it. Yeah. yeah did she it. go to a next room and just deal with someone else? I don't, I don't know. I never thought about that, but yeah. It was so it hard been, being on the other side like so that. So hard. Yeah. And there's certain, so there's certain circumstances that would affect different people. So for me, I don't have children, but the, the circumstances that would affect me would be like the older, the older man between the ages of 55 and 75, who may be passing. Right. And then the wife is sitting next to the bedside with maybe the older children, because that was my family dynamic right. where I would have other coworkers that would have this, they would get really worked up with the children in the room yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. So they would send me in with the children because I, I could handle that easier because right. I didn't have right. such a deep connection with yeah. that particular scenario or situation where then I would say, Hey guys, I can't handle the 60 year old man with the wife grieving at the bedside with cancer. So they said, Oh, I can handle that one. I'll go in right. and work with right. that family. Yeah. So we got to a point where we started to recognize who, who could handle those certain dynamics and who couldn't. And I'll tell you, there are certain ones you just, it never gets easy and you don't, you do build a little crusty shell around you, you know, working in that, oh, but so sure. every now and then that, that soft center would, would, it would just hit you. It would touch yeah. you. And it yeah. was hard. There were a couple families. I, I had to take a step out of the room and say, you know, let me go collect myself for a minute. You're, you know, what you're going through right now is really having an impact on me. And I'm going to go get someone else to come in and work with you right now. Yeah. And so I think it's just honoring your emotions and where they're coming from. And yeah. it's tough. It's it's tough to go, to be the one going through it. And it's also tough to be the one observing it, you know, yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, I do want to take a moment to say thank you because the people who did show up, you know, hospice did come up and we talked about bringing my husband home and it just, you know, the doctor was very frank. You know, he was kind of like, he said, look, your husband's going to die probably at the end of the week because he's young and his organs are not going to want to quit on him, you know, right away. And so it was just the, that those frank conversations. But what I, what I remember now is that I wasn't the only person that he had that conversation with, you know? And so thank you for doing what you do because it's not easy. You see us on our worst days, yeah. you know, you get to witness us in, in the most most, ho hopefully the most horrible life experiences that we ever have. Mm -hmm. And um, that takes an incredible amount of, um, I'm not going to say courage, but fortitude and passion. And I'm really grateful for that. Well, so thank, thank you. you. And, and I thank you too, for being vulnerable and sharing your story with us today. It is not easy to come on here and talk about uh, death and cancer and loss. These are taboo subjects, you know, within our society. And uh, you know, you are paving a path to bring mm. light to these areas. Thank and I you. appreciate all that you have done, everything, all the hard work that you've put forward to uh, write your book, to start, you know, 100 Acts of, of, of Love and, you know, just bringing these things 
to us. So that way we have these tools. And so how can people reach out to you? How can people connect? Where can they learn more? Where can they find your book? <laughs> sure. So <laughs> big, good question. The above. <laughs> the above. So if you go to 100 acts of love.com and that's the number 100 acts of love.com backslash what not to say, you can download the other four things never to say to anybody dealing with any crisis. It's a free download. And not only do I share not what to say, but I share alternative things to say. So you you're not going to walk away with great. Now I know what to say. Now I don't know what to say. So you'll have that. Um, you can also, you know, I, I'm mostly on LinkedIn. I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. So you can find me on there at Kim Hamer on LinkedIn. Um, I do um, LinkedIn lives every single Thursday at 12 noon Pacific time. So if you have a question, even if it's a question about personal, about what you're doing now in your personal life, doesn't have to be work-related, please DM me. And I am happy to answer that question. I will answer it on a LinkedIn live if that's what you you know need. Um, and then you can also find me on Instagram. I do a lot of, I love Instagram. I haven't moved over to Snapchat, not quite on TikTok either, yet. <laughs> no, you know, I, I'm an Instagram woman. I will eventually move over to TikTok at some point probably when it's starting to fade out. Um, um, so you can find me on Instagram at 100 acts of love. Again, that's the number 100. Um, and then I think lastly, I just really want people to know, and, and this comes, this really just feels so important is I know that sometimes it feels like you just can't do another day. And I get that. And I get that in more ways that I even shared during this podcast, but please remember you matter you know, and hold on because it does get better. You really matter. People need you. People need you for exactly who you are in in their lives right now. Um, So if anyone really needs to hear that right now, I hope you can hear that really loud and clear. You really, really, really matter. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for this rich and raw conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your vulnerability and the energy that you are bringing into the world. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. You deserve to navigate your life in alignment with health, happiness, and abundance. To learn more about the services that I provide, including Beyond Quantum Healing Hypnosis, EFT Tapping, and The Emotion Code, visit my website, at www.theexistentialempath.com.